YouTube, uh, my fellow musers. Welcome back to Modern Day Musing. My name's Tom, and here's my first video on, really it's anything, quotes, books, uh, a video I watch myself, maybe an article. That's what I wanted to do, it's kind of a topic video. And this, today, I'm gonna start off with a book I recently purchased uh, around the winter. It's called The Ingenuity Gap by Thomas Homer Dixon. And essentially the thesis here it's, I mean, you see all right, with, right with the title, it says, how can we solve the problems of the future? And his thesis is that in human history, it's required, and this is kind of an, an obvious statement, but uh, he obviously expands it. In human history, it's required like, extreme innovation and ingenuity to solve problems, and that's how we advance. But nowadays, are we, are we realizing or doing the right things to create the ingenuity needed to solve the problems and uh, moreover, I think another another layer to his his uh, thesis or his his belief or argument is that are we also creating more problems with how we're doing things? Like we also need to really muse, reflect about what, how we're operating. And so I'm gonna get into right away. He talks about economic optimists, which is something I've definitely experienced in my studies, taking some economics courses. So what he says here is uh, economic optimists, as I have come to call them see the human experience as a grand story of exuberance, energy and expansion, the surmounting of hardships and misery. They correctly point out that, on average, humans have never been so well off, and they generally go on to argue that given enough time, we can solve all of our problems. That is, supply the ingenuity we need through a combination of free market science and liberal democracy. So that optimism I think nowadays, because this book was published uh, published in 2000, his research was from the 90s. I think nowadays, with uh, 2008, the crash there of the uh, the economy, that has definitely got um, some economists more liberal, left leaning, definitely more skeptical about the free market for sure. But um, all most of the stuff I've been taught in school, I've taken I think four or five economics courses, one such as uh, money and financial markets. It was a lot of just uh, perpetuating the normal story about the free market and how letting the market dictate itself and uh, the theories around that. And, and I didn't see a lot of questioning, but also that's something I see as a problem in university in general is it's more you just told information and you must regurgitate it. But that's a whole other video topic, guys. <laughs> Anyways, I'll continue with his, uh, his talk, him talking about economic optimists. Enclosed within a limited and selective reality, economic optimists tend to make a number of mistakes about the nature of the problems humanity faces and our capacity to solve them. Four mistakes in particular I concluded. First, they tend to take truly, the truly extraordinary improvements in human well-being over the past two centuries and project them linearly into the future which, without much questioning or reflection. That's huge. I mean, this is the channel is called Modern Day Musings, it's, so it is all about reflection. So obviously, I, I that's something I've when I was reading this book, and I'm still reading this book. Uh, that really struck me because you do see it a lot. Um, people act as though we've created the perfect system. At least some people. I, again, like I said, there is more of a uh, pushback now, and I think we just need to muse about that again and think about it. That's why I'd love to hear your opinion after on this this whole these whole topics this whole uh, his whole thesis here about well not his thesis but his viewpoint on this second they generally present only highly aggregated statistics about major trends in human well-being usually statistics on life expectant on things like life expectancy or per capita gdp averaged across whole societies or regions of the world but when these statistics are disaggregated that is when the averages are broken down into subsets the story is less clear than they suggest. That for me, uh, it's part of the modern day problem I see growing up in the modern day or anyone who's in the modern day represented a lot of information. And he has another quote I'm gonna read that really sums this up. You presented a lot of information, but um, do we know what, like the validity of it and with statistics, I mean, there's a quote my uh, uh, high school economics teacher told me, uh, him kind of jokingly or mockingly about statistics. There's a lie, a damn line, a statistic. And sometimes that's true because you can misrepresent data by, how you, by the data you choose and what you choose and how you choose to represent it as. So like he says here, when you take a whole 
clump such as the whole world to show things like per capita GDP instead of different parts of the world. Anyways, moving on. Uh, thirdly, economic optimists usually downplay events and facts that raise serious questions about their worldview. Problems like global climate change are dismissed as scientifically groundless, although I think nowadays you can see the difference from 2000 to now. That's not as much as the mainstream opinion. Or, or at worst, minor inconveniences that can, that can and will be surmounted by human creativity. So that again, um, they downplay events and facts that raise serious questions about their worldview. That's a human thing. I don't think that's an economic specific problem. But definitely, again, there is kind of a severe optimism with economic, uh, economists. Uh, fourth, economic optimists tend to regard market science and democracy as panaceas, but they are not. Most of today's markets are riddled with market failures. The true cost and benefit of the goods and services traded are often not reflected in their prices. And so the ingenuity response of our economies is skewed. For me, this last point, it's, it's really important. The market, like there has been market failures. And again, since 2008, we've been more critical. But uh, the last section where he says the true costs and benefits of goods and services traded are not often reflected in their prices. And that's again, I don't, it's because we're not really reflecting as a society enough. So what do you like, what, what, the things you buy, what value do they really provide you? I mean, we always like you go and I have yet to come up with a definitive answer to this question what determines the price of a product really because it's always just essentially been you have especially in the accounting courses you have your initial cost and then your fixed costs and then you apply a markup well how do you determine that markup it's kind of just seems to be like what you want so if you want to make it 120 percent then you can do that and to me that's where the the ethical side of business we need a lot more musing on and now I'm just gonna close this out with his final statement, which I kind of already touched on, but he sums it up very well. Today's overwhelming volume and variety of information makes it possible by selecting and connecting data points carefully to paint practically any picture of the world and make it seem accurate. So the picture we paint, the pictures we paint are often more a reflection of our deepest personal orientation, especially of our basic optimism or pessimism than of empirical evidence. And to me in the modern day, that's, that's really, that's the beauty and the beast, if you want to term it like that, of the modern day and the information age. The, just the overwhelming volume, as he says, of information. For me, I sometimes I just don't know what to believe because there's so much information. Or when you're researching something, what is right, you get a, a million, like when you search something, you get a million search results sometimes. And it's like, think about that. Like your, your mind can't even quantify that number but yet there's that much information on what you just searched. And then as, as well, you have almost in a lot of people now with the, uh, the rise in the availability of the internet and um, technology, a lot of people can Google something, get that fact or create their own survey and then make it a pretty Excel graph and make a little presentation on it. And you, if you just went in looking at it without any skepticism you would be like wow that's really that's really that's a really good point like i believe you that's how can i not it looks it looks so well presented and i think that's again why we need to emphasize using guys this this to me he's saying his main thesis is about creating like the ingenuity gap and he's kind of taking more negative view where he's not so sure if we can conjure up the ingenuity we need to solve our problems Whereas I would like to kind of, cause that's kind of like, sometimes you're, I'm reading, I've only got maybe a hundred pages into this book and you get kind of, oh crap, we're really in for it now because of all the, all the problems he's bringing up. But I think the more optimistic take from this book is that uh, we just need to really reflect more on what we're doing and slow things down. I mean, we haven't advanced, I don't think, as much as the technology. I mean, I don't know how you could conjure up an argument that would disprove that. Uh, technology is something new is being created probably every day where a society is not bettering or being or uh, something is being created to better society or change society every day really it's more like uh, society as a whole I mean not just little products and furthermore some of the products we make are they might make things easier but is that solving is that ingenuity we need 
I think these are two questions. And I'll definitely do more videos on this. I'll definitely do more videos on this book as I continue to read it and uh, as a follow-up to this video for any questions or comments you guys have, anything you'd like to muse about what I've just presented to you. Again, the book's called The Ingenuity Gap, Thomas Homer Dixon. Give it a look if you can find it. Uh, I'd love to hear what you say, guys. Let's continue this muse movement.